The Necklace by Henry Reen Albert Guidi Morpassant. She was one of those pretty and charming girls who are sometimes, as if by a mistake of destiny, born in a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no means of being known, understood, loved, wedded, by any rich and distinguished man, and she let herself be married to a little clerk at the Ministry of Public Instruction. She dressed plainly, because she could not dress well, but she was as unhappy, as though she had really fallen from her proper station, since with women there is neither caste nor rank and beauty, grace, and charm act instead of family and birth. Natural fineness, instinct for what is elegant, suppleness of wit, are the sole hierarchy, and make from women of the people the equals of the very greatest ladies. She suffered ceaselessly, feeling herself born for all the delicacies and all the luxuries. She suffered from the poverty of her dwelling, from the wretched look of the walls, from the worn-out chairs from the ugliness of the curtains. All those things, of which another woman of her rank would never even have been conscious, tortured her and made her angry. The sight of the little Breton peasant who did her humble housework aroused in her regrets which were despairing, and distracted dreams. She thought of the silent antechambers hung with oriental tapestry, lit by tall bronze candelabra, and of the two great footmen in knee breeches who sleep in the big armchairs made drowsy by the heavy warmth of the hot air stove. She thought of the long salons fatted up with ancient silk, of the delicate furniture carrying priceless curiosities, and of the coquettish perfumed boudoirs made for talks at five o'clock with intimate friends, with men famous and sought after, whom all women envy, and whose attention they all desire. When she sat down to dinner, before the round table covered with a tablecloth three days old, opposite her husband, who uncovered the suit serene, and declared with an enchanted air, Ah, the good pot are you few. I don't know anything better than that. She thought of dainty dinners, of hinning silverware, of tapestry which peopled the walls with ancient personages, and with strange birds flying in the midst of a fairy forest, and she thought of delicious dishes served on marvelous plates, and of the whispered gallantries which you listen to with a sphinx-like smile, while you are eating the pink flesh of a trout or the wings of a quail. She had no dresses, no jewels, nothing. And she loved nothing but that, she felt made for that. She would so have liked to please, to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. She had a friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, who was rich, and whom she did not like to go and see anymore because she suffered so much, when she came back. But, one evening, her husband returned home with a triumphant air, and holding a large envelope in his hand. There, said he, here is something for you. She tore the paper sharply, and drew out a printed card which bore these words. The Minister of Public Instruction and Madame Georges Rampono request the honor of them and Madame Loisel's company at the Palace of the Ministry on Monday evening. January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband hoped, she threw the invitation on the able with disdain, murmuring, What do you want me to do with that? But, my dear, I thought you would be glad. You never go out, and this is such a fine opportunity. I had awful trouble to get it. Everyone wants to go, it is very select, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole official world will be there. She looked at him with an irritated eye, and she said, impatiently, and what do you want me to put on my back? He had not thought of that, he stammered, why, the dress you go to the theater in? It looks very well, to me. He stopped, distracted, seeing that his wife was crying. Two great tears descended slowly from the corners of her eyes toward the corners of her mouth. He stuttered, what's the matter? 
What's the matter? But, by a violent effort, she had conquered her grief, and she replied, with a calm voice, while she wiped her wet cheeks, nothing. Only I have no dress, and therefore I can't go to this ball. Give your card to some colleague, whose wife is better equipped than I. He was in despair. He resumed, come, let us see, Maffield. How much would it cost, a suitable dress, which you could use on other occasions, something very simple. She reflected several seconds, making her calculations, and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing on herself an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she replied, hesitatingly, I don't know exactly, but I think I could manage it with 400 francs. He had grown a little pale, because he was laying aside just that amount, to buy a gun and treat himself to a little shooting next summer on the plain of Nanta, with several friends who went to shoot larks down there of a Sunday. But he said, alright, I will give you 400 francs, and try to have a pretty dress. The day of the ball drew near, and Madame Loisel seemed sad, uneasy, anxious. Her dress was ready, however. Her husband said to her one evening, what is the matter? Come, you've been so queer these last three days. And she answered, it annoys me not to have a single jewel, not a single stone, nothing to put on. I shall look like distress. I should almost rather not go at all. He resumed, you might wear natural flowers. It's very stylish at this time of the year. For 10 francs you can get two or three magnificent roses. She was not convinced. No, there's nothing more humiliating than to look poor among other women who are rich. But her husband cried, how stupid you are. Go look up your friend Madame Forstier, and ask her to lend you some jewels. You're quite thick enough with her to do that. She uttered a cry of joy, it's true. I never thought of it. The next day she went to her friend, and told of her distress. Madame Forstier went to a wardrobe with a glass door took out a large jewel box, brought it back, opened it, and said to Madame Loisel, choose, my dear. She saw first of all some bracelets, then a pearl necklace, then a Venetian cross, gold and precious stones of admirable workmanship. She tried on the ornaments before the glass, hesitated, could not make up her mind to part with them, to give them back. She kept asking, haven't you any more? Why, yes. Look, I don't know what you like. All of a sudden she discovered, in a black satin box, a superb necklace of diamonds, and her heart began to beat with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. She fastened it around her throat, outside her high neck dress, and remained lost in ecstasy at the sight of herself. Then she asked, hesitating, filled with anguish, can you lend me that, only that? Why, yes. Certainly. She sprang upon the neck of her friend, kissed her passionately, then fled with her treasure.